power. Is it important? Yeah, it probably is if you're doing flat out fire road sprint tests. But if you're in the mountains, I think you'll probably find that power is nothing without control. Now, before we get into it, let's find out exactly what power, watts and torque is. Power is the total output that a motor can put out and is a measure of the rate of work the motor can do over a period of time. It is measured in watts and can be explained by this equation. Power equals force times velocity. So, in general, the more force a motor can put out over a shorter period of time, the more power it will have. And of course, the crazier climbs you'll be able to do on your e-mountain bike. Now, watts are a measure of the rate that power is generated or consumed over time. One watt is the equivalent of one joule per second, and the more watts a motor can produce, the more power it will have. Now, torque is the twisting force that tends to cause rotation and is measured in newton meters. The higher the torque figure, the more twisting force a motor can put out. Torque is therefore a better indicator of how quickly your e-bike will accelerate than power itself. So, very simple, but the key part here to remember is that the maximum watts an e-mountain bike can produce is closely linked to the speed you are spinning those cranks. Now, most of the time, power is gonna be of most use in a climbing environment rather than a downhill one. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. But first of all, let's have a look at the ways of measuring power. So what are the watt numbers on electric mountain bikes? Well, this pedal assist electric bike, such as the one I'm riding now, are actually restricted to 250 watts average. But it does actually vary from brand to brand in terms of the maximum output. For example, a Shimano E7000 motor can kick out over 400 watts max, whereas a specialized Bros motor, about 560, and a Rocky Mountain, over 700 watts maximum. I think in many ways you can actually compare an e-mountain bike to athletes, different types of athletes, sprinters or long distance runners. For example, my colleague Dan Lloyd on GCN. No angel when it comes to lifestyle, but he can sustain 300 watts over a one hour climb. Compare that to say a top level Tour de France racer such as Richie Porte, who can sustain about 400 to 500 watts over the same climb. And then you've got those sprinters such as Andre Greipel, who can do 1900 watts over a short period. I think what we're saying here is that e-bikes don't produce any more power than what a top level athlete can produce. And then when you're comparing e-bikes to athletes, e-bikes are probably more long distance runners than sprinters. So I guess the next question is, does rider power matter? Well, yes it does, but not quite as much as technique. And what about motor power? How does that help you when you come to a classic e-mountain bike situation such as this? Is more power really better? So what are the factors affecting your ability to control your e-mountain bike then? Well, first of all, software. Now, some motors are open to manipulation, such as Bros and Shimano, whereby you can control the way the power is delivered to the back tire. Then, of course, you've got such things as componentry, tires and gearing. Geometry has a big impact in your ability to control your bike because chain stays, short chain stays are more difficult to control than longer chain stays when it comes to hill climbing. And then of course, let's not forget two important factors such as mode. How much assistance are you gonna be using on your e-bike? And finally, the ground conditions. So we're here in the amazing Lake District and I wanna show some examples where power counts for little without control. My first example is in this pretty snotty bridleway climb. And uh, what's gonna be of importance here is such things as timing. It's pointless having power if you can't use the timing right, pushing on the pedals in the right places to get up for these little rock steps. There's probably about 200 of them on this particular climb. So you're out in the mountains doing a mega loop and it's quite possible you will come across a section such as this and you'll never have ridden it before maybe, but it's really important that you hit it correctly first time. And of course, mode is gonna be very important in how you tackle this because it's very easy to think, yeah, stick it in boost mode and it'll power me through. But sometimes boost mode will actually push you forwards a little bit too far and rush you through the section. So that means you've got little control of your bike. So I've selected trail mode on my 70 newton meter Canyon Spectralon with a Shimano E8000 motor. I'm gonna attempt this technical rock section for the first time. Now remember, if you get it wrong, you're probably gonna be pushing your 20 kilo plus e-bike up that section. So it's really critical to get it right. I'm feeling a bit nervous, but here we go. 
I think you just got to take it easy. Really, really take it easy. I think your confidence just builds. I guess then, of course, things can get ridiculously technical. And in such situations, the control variable is actually your fitness, not the power of the bike. Beasting yourself in the Lake District. Now again, I'm on the Levo in trail mode. Uh, feeling a little bit nervous. Oh. 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 Wow, can't believe I've actually done that. Now I don't want you to get the idea that I'm saying more power is so what I'm saying is more power is good, but you still need to be able to deliver the power and control it. Sometimes it's actually better to have softer, lower power when it comes to technical sections like this. Clearly, if this track was smooth and flat, then more watts and more power is going to get to the top quicker. However, when things get technical, such as places like this, it's not just about power, it's actually about technique. Choosing the right line, keeping your weight on the rear tire enough. Power is not going to get you up this hill any easier than one with a little bit less. Now, as you saw on the previous run on the Levo, I wasn't trying to race up this super technical rock climb. I'm trying to box clever because when you have climbs like this, you might have to sustain a run of about 400 meters, 800 meters, and you simply won't do that by racing up the hill. In the classic situation, we've spent the last 15 minutes pedaling up a rock bed, and then we're out of the bed onto a really slippy, muddy bank climb. So here, the factors affecting power are gonna be such things as componentry, and cadence. Now on the Canyon Spectral, we've got a 2.8 Maxxis Minion DHR2 in the back, and that's gonna to compare to the Shorty, which is more of a mud tire on the Levo. Let's see how they get on. So again, cadence is really important. Easy. Right, let's see what happens if we back off the cadence on this bike and make it more ragged. So I'm going slow and then trying to go fast. So again, that's not about the power, it's about the way you spin the pedals on your e-mountain bike. Now both these tires aren't particularly soft compound and the shorty is more of a mud tire than one you'd actually use on rock. So it hasn't actually excelled in the rock sections we've been riding so far, but on this muddy bank, I expect it to have a slight advantage over the Minion. Yeah, it's far easier to control that grippy mud tire. I'm guessing I can probably be a little less subtle with my cadence with this mud tire. I can push it down hard and it'll dig in, which is what will not happen on the Minion. And finally, a crazy steep rock section like the ones we've been doing earlier. I wanna, wanna focus on here is the effect of geometry on power, and in particular, chain stays. Now, short chain stays and long chain stays. Short chain stays start at about 420 millimeters, where long chain stays, such as the ones on the Mondraker level, go up to 490 millimeters. And what that means is gonna be a different weight bias depending on the chain stay length. Short ones, you're gonna be over the back. Longer chain stays, you're gonna be over the front. So you need to be really careful in how you position your body when you're going up big climbs like this, because it really will affect how that bike climbs. There's no point having all that power if you can't get your body in the right position. So what do we mean then when we talk control? Well, very often you'd be riding sections like this ahead of me, blind on an e-bike. So it's all about interpreting the terrain as you get up there. Now, this is my first ride up this climb. Again, I'm just trying to take it easy and pick my way up there. Okay, same run again. Now I'm on the Specialized bike, or as previously I was on the Shimano E8000 system. Again, it's no easier. It's just about picking your lines. 
power, then yes, it probably will win you over in a car park or on a fire road sprint test. However, don't forget some of the other more important factors when it comes to riding your e-bike, such things as agility, stability, handling, and fun. And then about power, more power, well, that's gonna equal less range. And then that final important factor, the feeling of the motor. Does it feel natural or does it simply feel overpowering? So there you go, Borrowdale e-bike heaven. Don't forget to click on the globe to subscribe to EMBN so we can continue to bring you technical videos such as this. If you want to see more, check out the video I did on e-bike motor fundamentals down by here. In the meantime, don't forget to leave your comments below and to give us a thumbs up if you like this video.